<laughs> You're back. Spring quarter. That means that we just celebrated spring break. One of the things that is most exciting to me about spring break is that Easter fell in the middle of it this year. Actually, I'm sure really, yeah. Easter is my favorite holiday. Uh, a lot of people, Christmas has got the favorite. For some of you guys, it's April Fools. For me, I dig Easter. And the reason I dig Easter is because it's the, at the heart of the Christian faith, even more so than Christmas. But more than that, it is an amazing story. I mean, just think about the story of Easter. You're in your dorm room late at night, some of your friends are over. Hey, what'd you guys do over spring break? Oh man, I was in it, I got lost in Oakland. Whoa, that's an amazing story. What about you? Well, we were whitewater rafting and then, you know, class five rapids, boom, some bonehead teenager. Ah, ah, whoa, that is an amazing story. Uh, what about you? Run through a cow field, dodging cow patties, got stuck on an electric fence. Whoa! How about you, Jesus? Well, I died for the sins of the world, was buried for three days, and then came back to life under my own power. Next guy. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> you win, Jesus. It's an amazing story. I mean, it is it is off the charts amazing. By the way, each of those other stories actually happened to me. Um, <laughs> so you can ask me about the list. Um, the, the, the electric fence one in particular is quite memorable. Um, <laughs> I actually burned a hole in my shirt. Um, not over the spring break. Just in, in my life, in my life. Um, so, so here's the thing. Easter. Wow. That is the, the culmination of the Gospels. That is where the, the story comes to its fulfillment. At, at the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do you do for an encore? How do you have a sequel to that story? That's why I find it so interesting that the way Luke begins the book of Acts is self-consciously as a sequel to the gospel. It goes like this. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. I want to focus on one phrase there at the beginning. What he began to do and teach. There's a lot in that word. There's the idea that Jesus isn't done doing stuff yet. That this story is going to be about what Jesus continues to do and to teach. That the story of Jesus had a comma, not a period at the end. Now, of course we know that's true in one sense, because, yes, he died, but then he rose to life. However, then he left earth. He went to heaven. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. So how does he continue to do, continue to do and teach stuff on earth? And how can you top the story that we just read? I mean, it just seems inevitable that any sort of sequel to that has got to go downhill. If you've been around the Bible much, if you've been around sermons or Bible studies or Sunday school classes, little flannel graph boards, um, you've probably heard that one of the ways that the gathered group of God's followers is referred to is as the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Now, you may have just thought that was some sort of cutesy metaphor, talking about how we're sort of connected to one another, and there is that element to it. But the New Testament takes it much more seriously than that. He is the head, and we are the body, and he continues to do and to teach on earth through us corporately. And the book of Acts is the next phase in that. It is the Gospels part two. It is literally the book of Luke part two. And it's about what Jesus continued to do on the earth through his apostles. Now, there's a problem. If you've studied the Gospels much, if you've studied them even a little bit, you've come to the conclusion, probably, uh, that Jesus' earliest followers were, in large measure, boneheads. Um, they, they, they were bumbling. They were unclear about some of the most clear teachings of Jesus. And about his obscure teachings, they had no sense whatsoever. Um, they were afraid. They were very timid. Uh, Peter, the one who was called the Rock, three times denied Jesus. One time, when faced down by a little school-age girl. This big, burly fisherman. She's like, do you know Jesus? No, I've never met the man! Ah! Um, Jesus is going to continue to work through these guys? Really? That's plan A for the redemption of the world? All right. So obviously, there is some sort of plot device which has yet to manifest, to which we must pay attention. Because these guys are clearly not going to be capable of doing the job. And so, Luke begins to introduce this theme of the transformation of Christ's followers and the people who are able to bear the weight that he's placed upon their shoulders. See, we had to verse 4. On one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, 
But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Da 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 da. So something amazing is going to happen here, especially to the ears of a first century Jew who knows the Old Testament scriptures quite well. Well, the Holy Spirit, wow, I mean, there are only 14 times in the Old Testament that the Spirit was poured out on someone. These are people like Samson and David and Gideon, warriors, warriors. Yes, Lord, is this the time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Yes, they're, they're in the soundtrack of their minds. They thought he was dead. But he's back, and he's bringing his posse with him. Bum, bum, bum. They're like, yes, we'll kill the Romans, we'll overthrow the government. They're back. This is the same mistake they made throughout the Gospels. Throughout the Gospels, they thought, finally, Jesus will bring the smack down. Political deliverance is ours. And Jesus keeps saying, no. No, 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 no. My kingdom is not of this earth. You do not grasp what I am planning to do here. And they still don't get it. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. They place their faith in him. They are what we would call Christians. But they do not grasp this most important concept. And they are not ready, despite the fact that they are in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, they are not ready to do what he has called them to do. So what is this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Jesus rebukes them. They say, Lord, is this time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Chill about the end of the world. Come out of your cave in Russia and focus on this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This empowerment, this Holy Spirit thing that is about to happen, is about you becoming my witnesses. People who are able to influence this world toward me and toward my purposes. Well, what does it take to be a witness for Christ? Well, it takes a couple things. Uh, three come to mind for me. Courage, character, and clarity. Courage. You know, if you've been a follower of Christ, especially here at Stanford for any period of time, that there are times when you are absolutely petrified to serve him. You are, you are intimidated beyond all reason. I mean, you're an American. No one's going to beat you down. I mean, you're not going to be put to death or beheaded or anything, but still, this terror grips you because you're engaged in a spiritual struggle uh, with cosmic forces trying to proclaim God's truth. And you're intimidated, like Peter was by that little girl. You have a chance to share with your roommate. Wow, that's horrible. Can I pray with you about that? But the words just won't come out of your mouth. Your friends are joking in the cafe. You're like, you know, that, that was funny, true, but not really fair. I mean, honestly, you know that's not what Christianity is all about. And that the Christians you know aren't actually that way. That's a caricature you're pulling from late night you know, comedy shows. That's not reality. But the words don't come out. You let it slide. You have many opportunities, but courage at times, seems to mean scant supply. But courage alone won't do it. But I, wanna, I, wanna, I really want to emphasize this, that courage is one of the most immediate consequences of the New Testament of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It says again and again, after they were filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts, they spoke the word of God boldly. Next, though. Character. Are you actually living the life that Christ has called us to live? It's, it's great to have courage and, and you know, clever words, but do you have a life that is worthy of emulation. That people look at and they say, wow, I can see God at work in you. I can perceive that, that what you have is something that would be desirable for me to incorporate into my own life. Tell me more. Character's got to be there if someone's going to be an effective witness for Christ. And indeed, we see that the Holy Spirit brings character to us. For example, in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He is called the Holy Spirit. What is his first name? Holy character, <laughs> courage, character, and clarity. Many times in the New Testament, Paul prays, allow me to speak the words clearly here. That Jesus promises that when we are put in situations of adversity, we will be given words to speak, that we need to be able to make plain the truth of God that we have stored in our hearts. Mm -hmm. To explain how it is that Jesus is not just a ticket to heaven, but no, 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 you, you missed the point. It's not just about forgiveness from your sins, although... Hey, huge! It's about a transformed life that begins here and extends into eternity. It's about a purpose. It's about destiny. It's about character and, and love and joy and peace and, and God meeting our needs in practical ways. It's about a friend. It's about all these amazing things. It's so much more than the caricature you might have about how Christianity is pie in the sky. And you need to be able to explain that. Courage, character, clarity. These are the things that the Holy Spirit is about to work in the apostles. So this, this mysterious event 
called being baptized with the Holy Spirit. The reason I bring that up now is I want you to think, if I'm lacking in any of these areas, if I've been too timid, if there are sin issues in my life I just can't conquer, no matter how hard I devote myself to them, if there are, um, if I'm a bumbler when it comes to time to explain, and I just can't find the right words, then perhaps the solution that Jesus gave to the apostles is a solution he wants you to consider tonight as well. Bear that in mind as we look exactly at what happens in the next phase of the story. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. In the interim, they select a new apostle to replace Judas. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues <coughs> as the Spirit enabled them. What? Whatever they were expecting, I can pretty much guarantee it was not that. <laughs> That's just weird, is what that is. And, and the thing I want you to catch is how weird it is to them, even. So, the thing you need to, if, you, if you're not familiar with the, the whole flow of the New Testament, Luke was not here at this moment. Luke comes into the book of Acts later. Luke begins the Gospel of Luke by saying, I went and I investigated all these things. I interviewed people. I did research to find out what happened. Um, I, I talked with eyewitnesses. And so Luke um, talked to Peter and, and John and the other apostles who were there in the upper room. There's 120 people. And he's like, so what was it like? What happened on the day of Pentecost? Like, well, it was, it was, there, was there was a sound. It was like, it was not a wind. And, and catch that, by the way. There was no wind. It was a sound like a wind. There was a sound like a wind. And, and, and then, then there was like it, was like, it was like there was tongues of fire on like Peter's head. It was really weird. Um, they can't explain it. They're, they're using this language of, of, of metaphor. And it's, it's, it's so overwhelming they cannot put into words what happened. But something did happen. Some, we know this happened. We began to speak in languages we did not know. And it was crazy. And so what happens in the story is they begin to spill out of this room where they're gathered into the public area. And they're out there and they're, they're going crazy. They're speaking these languages they don't know. They're, they're filled with exuberance, so much so. That, it draws a crowd, as it probably would here on campus. <laughs> if we just marched out of this room right now, it's what, like 9, 30, 9, 8, 8, 20, 9? I bet if we walked outside right now, we would find a crowd. We're behaving like this. Amen. Now that we're staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. <laughs> Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? List a lot of languages. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. <laughs> Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. They looked drunk. Now, now just to clarify, there's two kinds of drunk, right? There's I'm passed out, lying in my own vomit drunk, and there's I've been at the party 30 minutes, woohoo drunk, right? They're clearly in the we've been at the party 30 minutes, woohoo drunk. Um, they're like, they're going ecstatic because whatever has happened to them has unlocked some level of joy in their heart. Something that they did not expect happened, and it is good. And they are, what, is, what does it say they're doing? It says they are praising God in all these languages they do not know. It would be like you walk through White Plaza, all of a sudden people start singing out in, you know, say, uh, Mandarin. You know, praise to Jesus. He is, he is Lord. And someone else over here starts singing out in Swahili. Yes, God is good and his love endures forever. And someone over here starts singing out in, in Spanish. Um, Blessed be the name of the Lord Almighty. And someone else uh, begins to sing out in English. Jesus is king over all. And then someone else over here. Just all these different languages. Languages that we don't, some of which we would not know, and some that we would. Like, wow, this is crazy. And they're not just saying stuff. They're acting weird. They're exuberant in their worship. Now, this is one of the parts of the story I find most interesting. There's a lot in the story to be interested in. One of the things I, that just grabs my attention is that Peter is in, Peter's in there with him, right? He's like, yes, hallelujah. And then he notices the crowd is responding in an unusual way. And so he turns it off. Whatever is happening to the apostles is under their control. Did you notice it said they spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them? Not God spoke in tongues through them. They spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so Peter sees, this is freaking people out. I should give them a logical, coherent explanation of what's happening. Chick. All right, guys. So whatever's happening did not possess them. It empowered them. And so Peter explains to them what exactly is occurring in their midst. P 
Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You made known to me the paths of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence. In other words, what he's doing right now is he's appealing to the, to the stories they know best. He's saying, this, this thing is happening here. It looks freaky, but look, this is what you've been hoping for and waiting for. This thing that happened 14 times in the Old Testament, God promised in Joel. He'd do it for everyone. And this is it. He's pouring it out on everyone right now. What happened to Samson, David, Gideon, Zechariah? That can happen to you too. And you remember David, the greatest king Israel ever had. That thing you long for, the restoration of our, of our national sovereignty. That guy. He saw this day and rejoiced. Now, you might be saying, yes, David was talking about himself. Well, brothers, I tell you confidently. The patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. Go look, the bones are still there. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. We are all witnesses of the fact exalted. Now pay attention to this sense. This is the key to Peter's entire sermon. The question is, what does this mean? Peter's answer is, exalted to the right hand of God, he, Jesus, has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. This thing that is freaking you out, this is evidence of a profound shift in the ordering of the cosmos. What before God got metered out by dribs and drafts. He now just takes a giant bucket and pours out over all flesh. Regardless of social class, regardless of gender, regardless of anything, this wonderful empowerment is available to all. This is proof that Jesus is Lord. That these people are, are speaking in these unknown languages is evidence that the Spirit is poured out and that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. You cannot see into heaven with your eyes, but you can see its effects here on earth. David did not ascend to heaven. Yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise, and the promise is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Courage. Character. Clarity. Empowerment for witness. This promise is for each of you who has named Christ as Lord. 
that there is an amazing, astounding, staggering endowment of power that Jesus desires to pour out on you to make you his witness at Stanford, when you're back home visiting your family, when you go into the workforce, when you're completing your PhD. This is a gift, a promise that God makes available to you. Now, this is always an unusual topic to teach on because people come from such different backgrounds. Some people come from backgrounds where they've never even heard the phrase baptized in the Holy Spirit before. Speaking in tongues is something they've only seen uh, in, in comedy sketches. Uh, it is a very, very unusual concept for them to wrap their brains around. Other people, you were raised in church, and this is something that you've been taught since you learned how to speak. And most people are somewhere in the middle. Their church talked about it, they explained it in different ways, they meant somewhat different things by the terminology. And so what I want you to do now, for the next few minutes, is just field a couple of questions, whatever you have. Now, if your question is very technical or very detailed, and I think it might reflect um, something unique, uh, I'd be happy to meet with you later to talk about that. Uh, and if your question is something that's probably of more uh, general interest, I will, I will clear it right now, and then I have a few more words to say. The worship will come up, and we will um, worship Jesus. And I will gladly pray with anybody who wants to see if this is something the Lord wants to do in them. So what questions do you guys have about this, this concept of being empowered by the Spirit? But I guess I was always confused as to what was the, what the purpose is of speaking in tongues. That is a great question. Um, so why, God, why tongues? It's so weird. Um, and there's no obvious connection between what you say it's for, which is power for witness, and this thing which freaks out people. That does not make us good witnesses. In fact, in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, if, some, if, an, if someone who's not believing Jesus comes into a room and you're all speaking in tongues, won't he say you're out of your mind, that you've gone insane? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course someone would. So how in the world can this be connected to this empowerment for witness? You guys see the tension there? All right. I think it helps if we go back to the Old Testament. Um, I actually have a chart of all 14 of those times in the, in the Old Testament where the Spirit has talked about being poured out on people. Um, and I'm not going to go through it in detail right now. But the thing I want you to notice, for example, in the story of the 70 elders in Numbers 11, uh, is if you're not familiar with the story, here's what happens. Moses, um, God desires to expand the ministry of Moses to others, to, to take some of the weight off of Moses' shoulders, and to uh, bring 70 others into the leadership process. Now, so God takes from the spirit that is on Moses and pours it out upon them. What happens? You can look it up later, but they begin to prophesy. And then the text makes a point of saying, but they did not do so again. That's really interesting. They did this thing once, and then they never did it again. And it was disconnected from the purpose for which the Spirit was put on them, which was to be leaders. So why? Why would God have them do that when it was not related to the, to the purpose for which the Spirit was coming to their lives? Well, and that similar pattern occurs several times in the Old Testament, that there is a manifestation which is very different from the purpose. Clearly, they prophesied so that it would be a sign both to others and to them that the Holy Spirit really had come upon them. That it wasn't just a goosebump moment, right? We all had those, right? Just these, these times where it's like, oh, yes. And you're like, was that, what was that? Like, if the only way you could know whether or not you'd receive this empowerment from God was if you felt goosebumpy enough, you'd live in existential crisis. Like, well, did I get it or not? Maybe I should feel more goosebumpy. Turn the music louder, you know? Play the songs longer. Um, so God, in his grace, has established a sign that is independent of, uh, of the purpose so that we and others can know that this, this inner reality has actually occurred in our lives by means of an outer manis manifestation. Um, it's sort of like the light on your computer that tells you it's plugged in. Okay, that little light is not the same thing as electrons flowing into your computer, replenishing your battery, giving it power. That is another thing. The purpose of that cord is to give power to your battery. The light is the sign that it is happening and is disconnected. So why tongues? I think because it is weird. I specifically think it is because it is so weird that you would not make it up in your head. You would know. And so if it happens, you can be pretty sure, wow, 
Something really surprising just happened in my life. And there's another reason too, I, I truly believe. Because it is humiliating. It is a humbling thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jesus values us enough to give us the gift of humility in, in terms of refining our character. Did that answer your question, Eli? All right. Anything else? Aaron? Um, the the, the, the reverse of the baptism of the yes. Holy Spirit, and, and obviously more charismatic church when we talk about that, too. Do yeah. um, you see there's sort of two separate events of coming to faith and receiving the Spirit, or do we receive the Holy Spirit upon, upon coming to faith? Okay. Care to in the New Testament, clearly no one can be a Christian if they do not have the Holy Spirit dwelling with them. That is what it means to be a Christian. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, you had God above us as a dominant motif. In the Gospels, you had God among us in the person of Christ as a dominant motif. And now, in the, in the uh, Acts slash Epistle and ongoing age, you have God within us as the motif. That the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts and makes us Christians. It would be impossible for someone to have faith in God apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. However, it is clear in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, there is a distinction between um, receiving the Holy Spirit at salvation and having this, this, this empowerment that occurs in the book of Acts several times. And I'll give you a perfect example. In Acts chapter, I want to say it's chapter 4, verse 32, although I might not be right about that. I didn't write it down. But the apostles, who we see were, were, became believers earlier, the end of the Gospel of John, he breathes on and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Here, in the book of Acts, they receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, in Acts chapter 2. And then, later in, in a couple chapters later in Acts, they're praying, and these same people are refilled with the Holy Spirit. So there's something that happens independent of salvation. And it's not just a one-time event. It's an ongoing process in your life. Um, I can point to different places in the Bible, but it's clear that there is an element of subsequence. The most famous example of this would be in, uh, when Paul comes to the Ephesian believers in the book of Acts, Slow down. When Paul comes to the Ephesian believers in the book of Acts, um, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they say no. And then, uh, even earlier before that, in the, when the gospel goes out to the Samaritans, and Philip is there preaching, they send John and, was it Peter that they sent? They send the two of them out because the Samaritans had not yet received the Holy Spirit. They had believed in Jesus, but in the Holy Spirit. And this was a sufficient imports the apostles that they whip out the big guns. I mean, you don't get much heavy, heavy dutier than those two apostles. They send them out, and they go, and they lay hands on the Samaritans, and they receive the Holy Spirit, subsequent to their salvation experience. So yes, it is a distinct thing. Um, yeah. Anything else? Esther? Do you think if you pray to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you should be able to get it on the spot, or is it something like, is it I mean, is it like salvation when you get it right away, or like healing when sometimes you wait for it? It's a very good question, and it is one that has a lot of personal resonance with me. So, a little bit of biography. I was raised in a church that, that really did not teach about this at all. Uh, and I actually wandered away from my faith for a little while when I was younger. Um, and when I came back into Christianity, um, I, I found myself in a context where people talked about this. Um, and I was very skeptical. It was like nothing I heard before. And so I got out my Bible, I dug it, I asked a lot of questions, questions you guys haven't even thought of yet, apparently, um, or you've already resolved. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm but, but seriously, I was like, what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this? And, and sometimes people I was asking did not have good answers. But I kept digging around the Bible and I would find them for myself. And I was like, okay, well that makes sense, I see how that fits together. And eventually all the pieces of the puzzle were together, pieces of the puzzle were together, and I was intellectually convinced, but existentially unfulfilled. Experientially, boy. And so the, the group I was with would periodically offer to pray people. And so I would go up and say, pray for me. And I, to the best of my knowledge, I would pray with an open heart and just with hunger. And I would, yes, you know, Lord, if there's any sin in my life, get rid of that. If I'm, you know, being too, you know, whatever. Uh, and for well over a year, as I recall, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't keep a diary, but it, it was a long time. Uh, this was a pattern in my life. And as far as I could tell, nothing was happening. And then one day, I don't know what changed. I cannot point to any specific thing in my life. It's not like I all of a sudden repented of you know, that meth dealing I was doing or something. Um, uh, I, uh, I was prayed for, and this, this power was unleashed in my life, and I was transformed. And if you ask people who knew me that year in college, they, many of them probably point to the day. Even if they weren't there, they're like, yeah, Glenn changed. It was amazing. Um, I don't know why. 
But for some people, it takes a long time. And, and you see this in the Gospels. Jesus talks about uh, the need for persistence in prayer for various things. Um, and this is one of them. And I honestly have no idea why that is. Uh, except that, in some way, it fits God's good plan. Mm. May I have time for one more question, and then we're going to go to worship. Well, it seems like there's a lot of perfectly good Christians who just don't even think or ever talk about yeah. this. So, like, why do we have to talk about it at all? Great question. The first, I think, the most important answer, the reason we have to talk about it is because the Bible talks about it. Um, uh, that this is not just a one-off thing in the book of Acts, but theologians today largely agree that one of Luke's theme, one of his motifs in the book of Acts, is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Not just in Acts, but in Luke. He's laying the foundation for it. Luke talks much more about the prophetic than the other Gospels because he's setting up for this climatic event. Um, that's one reason. Uh, another reason I think it's very important to talk about um, is... When we talk about how these other people, this is not part of, we, we honestly are speculating. We don't know a lot about what's happening in someone else's heart and what's going on in the privacy of their life. There are people who speak in tongues you would never guess. Well-known Christians, you, you, because you don't hear them talk about it, you assume that they don't. And if you look throughout history, a lot of people, and they use different words for it too, so it becomes hard to track down. You read interviews or you're reading uh, biographies or autobiographies of, of, of Christians from times past. Uh, and they don't use the language that we've come to use today. Um, but when you read carefully, and page, you realize this was a part of their life too. This is not something that has ever disappeared from the church and is important to far more believers than you would imagine today. Now, I'm about to throw you a stat I do not have the source for. And I expect, I, I suspect I should say, it's slightly inflated, but I want to put the emphasis on slightly. Uh, I heard while I was in seminary that in the global world today, in the global uh, in the context of the globe today, global Christianity, <laughs> my point is, in non-American, non-Western Christianity, nine out of ten people who are coming to faith are doing so in a Pentecostal charismatic context. The ones who say they're empowered for witness are the ones who are actually doing the witnessing in the world today. That is the, the fact of global Christianity. And regardless of their denomination, it doesn't matter what the label is. In America, you can kind of guess. Oh, those people have this label on the door, they probably don't do that. Overseas, you got no clue. And you should assume that they do, unless you've got evidence that they don't. Um, and the final thing I would say, I guess, is this. Um, I understand... I would never want to suggest that someone is an inferior Christian because they've not had this experience. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say. What I am saying, though, is this. I believe that there is a promise in the Bible that is for you. That this is something God wants to do in you. Let others work out their own relationship with the Lord and follow Him with, with, with as much fervency and piety and holiness as the Lord enables them to. And let them deal with God on their own. Ask for you. You have to come to terms with what this text says. If you have further questions, I'd be happy to talk to you about them. I've actually got a Bible study put together when, when I was going through the ringer on this. Um, and I was analyzing almost literally every verse in the Bible that talks about the Holy Spirit and its relationship to to, to people in, in terms of empowerment. And I, I've got a, a pretty solid study, but I'd be happy to, I've got some copies tonight, I can email them to you later. Um, or I'll just happen to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. But the fact of the matter is, this is something that is important in the Bible, and therefore ought to be important in our lives as well. Final thing I'll say about that, and then I'll a couple of summary points. Worship team, come on up and get ready. Um, the structure we follow here, by the way, is that we do a little bit of opening worship, a message, and then some closing worship as a time to reflect on what has been said and to respond to it in prayer. For me, experiencing this fullness of the Holy Spirit, experiencing this baptism of the Holy Spirit, made it possible for me to be an intellectually fulfilled Christian. Let me explain what I mean by that. For a while I was doing this sort of dance where I would talk about, yes, God can do anything, but he doesn't anymore. God can part the Red Sea, but he would never do something like that. God can heal the sick, but not you. God can. Um, <laughs> sorry, you're out of luck. Um, and it's just this really interesting way of thinking about Christianity. There is no hint in the Bible. There is no hint that the, spirit, the, 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 the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are passed from the church. The only reason it is a part of so many churches' theology is a throwback to the Protestant Reformation, where Luther and Calvin and the rest were overreacting to the Catholic emphasis on fake miracles that was happening in the Middle Ages that so incensed the reformers that they threw the baby out with the bathroom. 
Honestly, you trace it back, that's what it goes down to. And I think we need to reappropriate this part of our faith, especially if we want to be full of intellectual integrity as we proclaim the gospel of Stanford. A couple of, a couple of words for you here. Um, we're going to offer a prayer with you. Don't want you to feel pressured. I, I do not want you to feel pressured, but I do want you to feel challenged. I don't want to shy back from this. I truly believe this is an important part of the faith. And it's something that if your only reason for holding back is because it'll make you feel weird, that is a bad reason. That is not the sort of reason that you make a life decision based on. Second thing, uh, I know some of you, just I've talked to you about this, this has been an issue for you. You, you. you believe it, hypothetically. You're open to it, you pray for it, but you've gotten sort of jaded. You've been there, done that, prayed that prayer. Not really interested again. Uh, I would encourage you on a couple of fronts. First, um, it does happen. Many people here will share. In fact, if I, I didn't plan for this. Who here would say they've had this experience? Would you just raise your hand? Let us see. Talk to them. This happens. Um, this can happen for you. These are nice, normal Stanford students, high GPAs, doing good things. <laughs> Sane people, not crazy preacher man alone. Um, <laughs> second thing I would say. Um, one thing that, I, as I reflected on my experience, for a while, one of the things I wrestled with was I expected God to speak in tongues for me. I did not realize I had to speak in tongues. Let me explain what I mean. You remember that one story in the Gospels where Peter walks on water? He sees Jesus walking on water. Jesus, you know, Lord, enable me to do that. All right, come to me. What if Peter just sat there and said, all right, the Lord said come to him. So if I just wait here in a Buddhist lotus position, he will levitate me across the water towards him. <laughs> he was sitting on the boat to this day. What did he have to do? He had to get up with his own willpower, walk to the side of the boat, look at the water and say, to himself, I've seen a lot of things sink in there. <laughs> Today, I've seen things sink in that water. I threw my line, my net in there, and it went down. I will choose to take my foot and put it on the water. And as he stepped out in the natural, he was sustained by the supernatural. Analogously, something similar happens. As you, as you are prayed for, as you begin to pray, you may <coughs> just feel the praise begin to rise up within you. That, that is what tongues is about in the New Testament. Tongues is praise. Run with that. Just start praising God. And if it feels like you all of a sudden want to say something that makes no sense, what are you waiting for? What exactly were you praying about again? <laughs> Run with it and see what happens. Uh, and I would encourage you in one last thought. Um, don't get hung up on, on speaking in tongues. That is, I truly believe, the external marker of the inner reality. That's not what we're praying for. We're praying that God would empower us to be his witnesses for courage, for character, and for clarity. Those are the things we want God to do in us, and we are saying to him, whatever it takes, God, even if it feels weird, doesn't make sense to me, or it's slightly embarrassing, I will be open to that. Here's what we're going to do. As worship team prays, um, I and Lindsay um, and others who feel led uh, would be very happy to pray with you. Uh, if you desire prayer, just slip out into these uh, stepped aisles here, uh, and we will uh, join with you in prayer and believe that God uh, will do this really wonderful thing in your life. Um, I would encourage you, if you're torn about whether to receive prayer or not, seek it out. And the reason I say that is because there is a correlation in the New Testament between having others pray with you and, and as the Bible says, lay hands on you, which simply means making physical contact with you, like putting your hand on your shoulder or something while we're praying, grabbing your hands praying with you, believing with you, and this, this, this reception, this experience. And so, if you have questions again, I will be happy to continue talking about this later. Uh, if you have some Bible studies, I'd be happy to hand out to anyone who wants to dig into the Scripture for themselves. But for now, I invite you to stand and join me in prayer when I'm going to pray.